Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for our um, final lecture in the lecture series and the Herbal Balan lecture series. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the Herbal Balan, uh, well, in actually in the Type of Cooper uh, program, but I'm also the Herbal Balan um, Study Center curator. And Type of Cooper and Herbal Balance Study Center are presenting the Herbal Balance Lecture Series. Lots of Herbal Balance in there. Um, but it's my pleasure to, to welcome you today uh, to our uh, closing lecture for the summer. Uh, we had a, a great program, but uh, the lectures continue and we have uh, more lectures slated for fall and then for spring and summer. So we have a, a, a rotating lineup of lectures. So we're um, finishing up the lineup for fall, which will, uh, the lectures for fall will begin in October. So we're very excited to, to share that with you as soon as we have more of that um, put together. I also uh, wanted to uh, thank Type Culture for the generosity in sponsoring uh, the recording of this lecture. Um, type Culture is an amazing uh, typographic resource, um, uh, and uh, we're very proud and, and, and very honored that um, we get their support to help build out the archive of lectures and continue to um, record and being available this, this wonderful archive of uh, Type Talks. You can find um, uh, the lectures uh, in two locations, uh, thanks to Type Culture. I'm going to post them in chat so everyone can see those links. But um, you can go to the Type of, uh, Type of Cooper's website and the lecture series. You just click on the past events. If you scroll down, you can see the past lectures we've had there and just click on the talk. And then you should see the video embedded in there. Uh, this lecture will be there in about a week or so. Um, you can also go to our Vimeo um, channel, uh, Cooper Type on Vimeo, and scroll through about eight years, 80-something plus lectures there. So it's an incredible, incredible archive. So once again, thank you to Type Culture for allowing us to record these. Um, I am extremely um, um, happy and very honored to have Jesus with us. Um, I'm going to introduce Jesus, our, our speaker today, um, who is going to present um, the talk today called A Beautiful Dark Heritage, the Historical Overview of Black Letter and Mexican Letterform Culture. Um, Jesus Parientos Mora is an associate professor at the University of Puebla. Uh, he's presenting today from 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 Puebla, so we're we're very glad that he's able to join us via the magic of Zoom and 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 internet technology. Um, he was the 2014 Elsevier Fellow at the Leiden University Library Special Collections. He is also the author of Legado de los Elsevier, Legacy of the of Elsevier, is the typographic restoration of 17th century characters. It's a, a book published in 2017. I'm going to post the link to that book so you guys can take a look at that. It's a great, great book on the Elseviers. Um, Jesus is certified in typeface design by the University of Reading, uh, has lectured in a number of institutions, including the Dublin Institute of Technology, UNAM, the Center for Printing History and Culture, the Sheffield um, Hallam University, and also here um, for us at, at uh, Type of Cooper uh, through the Typographics um, uh, series. He has designed a number of typefaces, which have been awarded by the Biennale Tipos Latinos, Biennale Iberoamericana, and Premios Clop. Um, you can find a lot of the, uh, the typefaces di distributed through the Monotype Network. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jesus to present a beautiful dark heritage. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, thank you uh, also, of course, to Cara and uh, Hannes and Mike. Uh, I'm really glad to be here, uh, and yeah, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to be there uh, without being actually actually there. So it's, uh, uh, it's one of the uh, many things that the technology let us to, to share uh, our own uh, local environments. In this case, of course, I'm going to, to talk about, about this, uh, uh, like, letter form I, I i call it letter form environment uh, i don't know if that's like a thing but it's a it's a concept that has been like uh, in in my in my mind but also in my work appearing the last uh, for the, the past two or three years because i do think that we are uh, influenced and affected 
by this letter for environments that we have. And uh, uh, well, that's one of the of the topics that we are going to to try to to expose here today. So well, uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm I'm really excited. I'm I'm a bit nervous, but mostly excited to be here. Uh, of course, the, in the Hub Global in Lecture Series, uh, uh, Taipat Cooper and uh, in general, the uh, Cooper is uh, like a really uh, important institution for graphic designers and type designers all over the world. So it's it's a historical thing even. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I'm here to present a beautiful dark heritage uh, this is from my perspective as a type designer, but also as a researcher. I, uh, as, as you, you, you said before, I am a professor in Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla. I'm in charge of uh, the introductory courses to typography. So most of the Lubelin work and uh, Cooper uh, uh, work, uh, we studied there. Uh, but I also uh, conduct the calligraphy and typeface design introduction uh, classes. So uh, everything is like, a, uh, like now it's come like getting full circle uh, to be with you today. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I have always been like inspired or admired Herb Lubalen, uh, but uh, I really want to, to, to begin this, this lecture uh, with my like my personal point of view, my experience, uh, because funny enough, Herb Lubalin was one of those uh, influences that led me to work with black letters. Uh, this all comes back uh, to 2004, uh, when in the International Biennial of Poster Design in Mexico, uh, I met this uh, this amazing editor and designer, David Consuegra, it was, well, in Spanish, is Bienal Internacional del Cartel in Mexico. That is like a conference uh, that uh, have been uh, essential in the formation of many generations of designers for like the past 24 years or so. And uh, well, in, in 2004, I uh, attend this conference of David Consuegra. Uh, that where he presented this book, American Type Design and Designers. Um, and in this book, well, this is like a, uh, a, like a really succinct uh, uh, compendium of American designers uh, from uh, late, late uh, 19th century to maybe the 80s or the 90s or so. And of course, there is a double page dedicated to the work of Herb Lubalin. And of course, I, I was familiar with the work of Lubalin through the famous avant-garde uh, typeface. Uh, but there was a particular sketch that got my attention and I kind of get obsessed with this uh, sketch. This was uh, for, for the, the homonymous film, The Agony and the Ecstasy. It's a film from 1965 about Michelangelo, uh, a really interesting, uh, interesting uh, picture. And uh, this was like the sketch that Herb Lubelin prepared with Hal Fielder. Uh, but uh, sadly, it didn't make made it to the, to the final poster of the, of the movie. Uh, but the, the image kind of stuck, got, got stuck in my, in my head like five, six years after that. And then I started to practice to, to identify some of the of the shapes in this in this sketch, and I tried to develop uh, uh, as a proper calligraphy model. Of course, uh, making up uh, all of the the letters that were not in the in the in the words, like all the the, the uppercase. Uh, uh, because well, when you work with a with a sketch or with a word so short. You need to imagine a lot. So I spent literally years uh, like doing this. And after, uh, I think it was say six years, six or seven years, I finally uh, decided to make this uh, a typeface. So this is a typeface uh, called Ecstasy. It's like a, a, one of my 
most beloved uh, works mm -hmm. uh, because, well, I have uh, this small uh, type foundry, it's Talavera type, and this is one of the most uh, popular or successful uh, typefaces that I have designed. Uh, and uh, this is the one, this is Ecstasy. Uh, and uh, it was awarded in the 2012 uh, Biennale de Tipos Latinos, the Biennale de Tipografía Latinoamericana, Tipos Latinos. Uh, it was uh, in the official selection. Uh, um, there are, actually, there are two, two typefaces there. The one in red, it's called Agony, and the black one, of course, the, the black letter one uh, is uh, Ecstasy. And both were selected uh, in, in Tipos Latinos uh, 2012. Um, and it was it, something really funny happened. Uh, when the selection was made, one of the jurors uh, made a comment of my, of my typeface. He chose to make a comment about my typeface. And he uh, he was, uh, I, I don't remember, uh, sadly, I don't remember the name of, of this designer. He was from South America. I think he was from Chile. Uh, and he described the work of uh, that I did in ecstasy, of course, from his outside point of view. He started to talk about alebrijes from Oaxaca and traditional uh, Roman uh, and the Mesoamerican shapes. And, and I didn't got to see that in my work. I, I thought I was like recreating the sketch that an American designer made in the 60s. Uh, and then these designers started to see a lot of things that I didn't even uh, cross my mind. Uh, and it led me thinking, uh, why don't I, don't I uh, get the, the same grasp as, as someone who is experiencing this? design because I, okay this is now mexican design uh, even though the inspiration was not from mexico uh, but then it, then it hit me uh, this is probably because of the letter from culture that i'm exposed to have been exposed every day since i was born um, i am from from puebla in, in mexico puebla is uh, the fourth largest city in in, in the whole country uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat ancient city. It's, it was founded in uh, 1531. Uh, and uh, of course, it was one of the earliest, uh, like, uh, in, no, in civilizations to, to, no, civilization of cities. One of the earliest cities to be founded in what was uh, then called the New Spain. Uh, this is where Puebla is. As you can see in the map uh, on the right, uh, it's really near to Mexico City, but also to the states of Hidalgo, Tlaxcala, Veracruz, Oaxaca in the south, Guerrero, and Morelos. That's like a like an interesting part of the, of the country because it's not precisely like the center of the country, but it's mostly like a social uh, middle of, of the country. We are not as southerns or as northerners as many other places so there is like a like a really uh, interesting uh, seminal culture over there of course maybe it's due to the to the nearness to to mexico city uh, but well i will uh, talk more on that later so in puebla it's really common to find uh, of course not only in puebla uh, as i said in the other states that I mentioned before. But uh, the most experience that I have is, of course, from Puebla. But it's really uh, like common to find this kind of, of shapes, uh, of black letter shapes or Gothic shapes. It's a, it's a good thing to say that in Spanish, we call it Gotica as, as, as in Gothic. But uh, I know that Gothic in, in, uh, in English and mainly in the type talking not necessarily equals to black letter, but well, the black letters or the gothics in, in, in Puebla is like really uh, easy to find the streets. This is from a newspaper that apparently it, it was founded in the 1940s. Uh, and apparently uh, they took this uh, black letter style from the times. No, uh, it's funny because not, not the times, not the London or the New York times, uh, get used to to to, to, to be attached to this 
uh, kind of, of black letter, I think, the Times, the, the New York Times it is. But uh, as a replica, many of newspapers in Mexico have this uh, like heading of, of black letter. There are soles, uh, sol, el sol is literally the sun, I know that. Uh, there are uh, soles in, in many cities. So it's El Sol de Puebla, El Sol de Tlaxcala, El Sol de Durango, et cetera. Uh, and well, another like really popular example is the, the, the Corona beer. I mean, that is even popular uh, in apparently in the whole world. Uh, and the, the, the thing is that, uh, again, apparently the Grupo Modelo, that is the, the company that uh, traditionally have uh, made this this year uh, they chose uh, a black letter uh, style for its naming uh, based on the tradition of beer in Germany so there was like these two connections to to the German culture or to the uh, anglo-saxon culture through uh, gothic letters but that doesn't necessarily connect to what happens in, in Mexico, at, at least not apparently in the nowadays Mexico. Uh, but they're not always about uh, brands and uh, headings uh, or, or things like uh, co from, from commercial uh, uses. This is uh, like a traditional pottery from Puebla that it's called Talavera. It's, uh, it's made with... Uh, uh, round uh, uh, brush, so you can actually see how the, the letters are uh, uneven and like look uh, with a, a little uh, uh, shape inside because when it once it gets to the oven, uh, it kind of inflates. So uh, it's resembling black letter, but in a kind of weird style. Look at the numbers, at least. It's not so traditional. Uh, this is uh, also like a, like a common thing to see, to see sign paintings or, or lettering uh, made from Talavera tiles, uh, and also with this uh, like cre new created or, or invented uh, black letter models. Uh, this is not actually from Puebla. This is from the Sutlan. That is another another uh, city from the state of, of Puebla. Uh, but you can also see it painted in the walls, like this this one that it's a, a tortilla store that even offers that their tortillas are one hundred percent corn. Uh, oh, by the way, I have to make like this this uh, little uh, uh, explanation. Uh, it's not really clear, at least not in, in Mexican Spanish, uh, whether if sign painting and lettering are two different things. Uh, we used to call it rotulos or rotulación in general. Uh, sometimes rotulos are sign painting and sometimes rotulos are just lettering. Uh, so you can actually like see this kind of, of, uh, of double use in those uh, applications. Uh, this is one of the, the main uh, uh, uses for, for, for uh, the black letter uh, uh, lettering. Uh, it's uh, street food, no? Uh, and you can actually like see uh, in, for, for example, in, in, the, in the shapes of the uh, lower case, A specifically, uh, the influence of some models. It resembles to something that you, you might be uh, familiar with, but it's not really that clear. Plus, this uh, kind of style of the shading and the coloring, uh, it kind of gets uh, interesting. Uh, the size of the, of the letters also are important because uh, you can I spot like small letterings, like probably... Uh, from 40 centimeters long, or this one that can be five or six meters and in a, in a second floor. So it's it's interesting. This is from Tlatlauquitepec. Uh, this is like a mixed uh, Mexican tradition. Uh, we have these uh, uh, popular uh, letterings 
that, it, that are called uh, sonideros. It's for uh, popular uh, parties and, and concerts. And uh, you can like actually um, find this kind of, of cross-breeding styles. Uh, each of, of, of these letters can be like two or three meters long. Uh, so it's like a really big, big piece of, of lettering. And it's made like in, in a really short uh, amount of time. Uh, of course, the, the, the black letters have also influenced some uh, graffiti and tag uh, on the streets, as you can see here. This also relates to the immigration phenomenon that has uh, fed the Mexican culture uh, both ways. Uh, uh, I mean, the Mexican culture, of course, happens inside the country, but it also gets uh, transported to the United States and then comes back. More on that later. Uh, also, the, the calligraphy from the streets or, or the Gothic uh, letterings from the streets uh, have like a really, uh, like a strong religious uh, tone, like this uh, message that is accompanied by by the uh, Guadalupe, Virgen de Guadalupe, it's more on a like on a faith uh, tradition, or or this one. This is from a pilgrimage from uh, a, a town uh, called Santa Isabel Cholula that is really near to to Puebla, all the way to San Miguel del Milagro in Tlaxcala. So a funny thing here is that you can see how people without evident uh, formal training in calligraphy, they still have a uh, strong uh, appeal for the black letter shapes. Uh, I, I think that this uh, mixing of lowercase and uppercase uh, all, all the way uh, around is, is, is interesting, at least, uh, because it, it, it speaks of uh, the things that you want to see, that people want to see uh, to to give the importance to their text. Speaking of, of the text and the importance, uh, this is uh, like a really uh, popular tradition. It has been replaced lately by printers, of course, by uh, digital printers, but uh, the diplomas were used, uh, used to be uh, uh, traced by hand, uh, even like in, um, in mixing styles or even mixing uh, letterpress with calligraphy, as you can see here, like diplomas from, from the uh, bachelor's degree or from PhDs and masters. There are some schools that still use that, but uh, sadly, uh, everything's like now uh, like composed, probably in the computer and printed, and even not, not even printed, just they send you the PDF now. Uh, that's kind of sad. But uh, it, this is uh, what I was referring some minutes ago, that the, the shape can be like really small, like you would expect in a document as proper calligraphy. Um, but this is like something that happened more between the 1920s all the way to the 1980s probably. And now it's more difficult to find, no? Uh, this is a, a door number, no? Uh, based loosely based in some kind of of uh, of, of factor, or I don't even uh, really know what kind of of, of graphic this is. Uh, I mean, black letter. Uh, but it's funny for me also to find it in in different uh, like materialities out of the ink and the paper. So the three the three dimensional shapes, or for example, uh, this uh, that is uh, used uh, the, the uses to sign uh, the the truck. No, uh, this is a truck to the transport uh, food, no? specifically as it says, no chilies and and, and fruits, uh, dry fruit. Uh, but the like, it's interesting to see how. I think that you might find in a diploma or in a uh, in a formal paper also gets used 
in uh, think out of the academic context. Uh, and it's, I think it's like the same, uh, for, for the same reasons. There is a tradition going on there that I will insist so much in this, in this concept, the appeal, the appeal of the, of the black letter. Well, this is just a, a couple of, of, uh, uh, of ice cream, uh, uh, street, street ice cream. <laughs> And you can actually like start to see how these black letters turn into new styles because it is text textura or texture, of course, but it kind of mixes with a slant or with italic or like this one. No? It's like this is like an italicized uh, weird textura. No, I, I don't even I wouldn't even try to put this kind of, of letters. Uh, in a classification, but it would be because it would be impossible to do, because every everyone uh, or every every example have its own uh, spirit, like this backslanted uh, backslanted batard or something. No, this is for a chicken uh, uh, butcher butcher shop. Yeah. And of course, there is a lot of uh, this. Is, this example for uh, it's it relates to to the one uh, in the truck with the with the San Miguel uh, uh, drawn in there, because uh, you can actually see when people make the letters by themselves as they imagine as they can, but they still try to imitate uh, this this kind of of shapes, and. Uh, this is just like a, a like, like a really small example uh, of of how the these these shapes are uh, are interesting to see, but also are everywhere. That's like my main point of this small collection is that that's it's everywhere. No? But now, as uh, my good friend and and colleague uh, Ro Hernandez would say, this is not BMR. I mean. I would compliment this is this is not Offenbach or Nuremberg. So why is this here? Why is the presence of black letters so uh, so there? I mean, it's, of course, it's nothing uh, resembling to to what you can find in Europe. Uh, but it's it's interesting to 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 think that this is part of our daily uh, environment. And uh, well, this is a case of a, of a genesis that happened. Uh, in in several places and took probably like 500 years to to take shape. I would call it a genesis on, across the time and space. Uh, and of course, it uh, can be traced back to three main sources uh, with its own interfining, of course. But the, these three sources uh, can be calligraphy, of course, typography, and book collections. So that's I have like a, a couple of, of, of examples of each to make to try to make this contrast with what we see in the streets. The calligraphy, uh, uh, the calligraphy, uh, like based it it has at least three different waves since its its beginning, and of course the beginning it was with the European arrival to the Americas. Of course, the, the, the conquest of, of um, what was Mesoamerica uh, by the Spanish Empire during the, the 16th century changed a lot. And uh, there was like a sharing of, of cultures. But uh, one thing that must be said is that it was not only the Spaniards who influenced the Mesoamericans. There was the Spanish, of course, the Italian, the French, and the Belgian influences on the culture and on the uh, writing traditions. This is because, well, the, the first educational uh, and, uh, effort was surrounding evangelization. So the need to take the, the word of the Lord, the gospel to the Indians from Mesoamerica, it was not precisely made by Spanish people. It was made mostly by French and Italian monks and of course, uh, some uh, some Belgian ones. Uh, 
but when when that process of well you, we, we can call it so many names i say it education some people say inculturization uh, of course the most common say is to, is to refer it as the conquest or uh, even the uh, like uh, colonialism no but well history uh, is there it happened uh, you cannot like like un undo it of course and that, that's not my intention this is not what this is about but i want to 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 refer to some uh, fascinating things specifically one is that both cultures across the atlantic both the judeo christian european western or how you want to say or how you want to to name it and the Mesoamerican will have a value for documentation. And that sent a precedent uh, that probably en ended up being the roots of our know uh, uh, culture. What we see now is uh, it's, a, it's part of a book. It's a, a mixed text tradition now book uh, from the uh, this is from the 14th century. Uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's an extract about the history of the Lord of Tututepec. Uh, who, 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 his name was Eight Deer Jaguar Claw or uh, Ocho Venado Garra de Jaguar. Sounds a bit a little bit better in Spanish, honestly. Uh, and he lived between 1063 and 1115, uh, and this was not precisely a book as we know it. This was a, a, a folded screen a book made of deer skin. And these books were supposed to be read out loud, not by letters, but by pictures. Uh, so the pictures were there. And the people who was uh, trying to, to do the reading uh, used to tell the story. Uh, so we can actually see in the uh, the, the character on, on the on the right, uh, you can see the name of of eight deer, the the little head of an animal. It looks like a bunny, but it's a deer, and uh, the the circles uh, are the 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 number, no eight deer, uh, and uh, well, this tradition uh, had their own branches. And when the Europeans arrived with the whole idea of the scribes and copies that are, were supposed to do this uh, like reproduction of the Bible, we are talking about probably uh, like 60 years after Gutenberg's uh, uh, Bible. Uh, they had to, to, to make this training for the Indians in Mesoamerica. So it was kind of natural to to take uh, the tlaquilos tlaquilos the word for scribe in Aguatl, it means uh, those who write by painting and the other word uh, in the bottom is tai wisitaku that's in mixed tech uh, that's the 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 scribe for the mystics uh, and tai uh, wisitaku means something like those that share their knowledge through painting so basically what the names of the scribes in Mesoamerica says is that they had this writing tradition, but they didn't write through the alphabet, through letters. Uh, they didn't have signs, they have pictograms, pictograms, photography, drawings. So in the Mesoamerican tradition, uh, uh, the act of writing and the act of drawing or painting, it was mostly the same. Uh, this is what I find interesting because when we talk about letter forms, of course, with that we talk about writing, but it's also mostly like drawing. So I think there's like a natural connection uh, with these ancient concepts, uh, because uh, of course, the scribes from the, from the uh, medieval times and the Aquilos from the Mesoamerican times, uh, it kind of connected in that way. Uh, so I think that's something uh, a bit of, of exciting if you took, take a, a look around, because you can actually see the, 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 the resemblance and the things that, that you can share. Uh, some things that I, I don't like about how history sometimes it's, uh, it's told is that apparently it's like uh, there's a, 
I struggled between uh, good and bad and, and what's wrong and what's right. But in the middle, there are always things that can be uh, appreciated. Uh, and those things are the coincidences. And I think that uh, we should work on that more, on what we agree on to. And I don't, I don't mean to ignore the differences, but to concentrate on better things. Uh, we can see here uh, two, two pictures. Uh, of course, the one in the left is a medieval scribe, and the one in the right is a Tlaquilo. Actually, you can see the clothes, the, the little word in Spanish that says pintor. No? But well, this takes us to the arts of writing. So the first wave of calligraphy that arrived from Mexico, of course, it was by the hand of education, as I was saying before. Uh, I want to make emphasis in the, the concept of arts of writing because calligraphy is uh, like a more 20th century word to use. One reference can be uh, like the famous book of Edward Johnston, writing, illuminating, and lettering. It never says calligraphy anywhere. So of course, from the 19th century uh, backwards, it was mostly called arts of writing because it's funny also to think that you cannot like separate writing from calligraphy as we do now. Most of the, the, the teaching that happened or that occurred in, in, in now uh, the New Spain or Mexico was around Rotunda and Batard. This is uh, a, one of the earliest mixed codices. Uh, so these mixed codices are called that way because uh, our books uh, written uh, combining both traditions, the pictorial one, but also with text. And you can, uh, you can see how it's like, a, like an explanation of, of, the, of the pictures. Uh, please spot the, the, the deer is the one with the blue or green horns. Uh, in the bottom, uh, it has uh, the text and in the top, uh, 10 uh, yellow circles. And the text says, Matlakl Masatli. And it means 10 deers or 10 animals. Actually, uh, that's what it says in Spanish, no? Que quiere decir diez siervos o bestias. So these uh, first documents were made for the, uh, mainly the Italian monks to understand what the books of the Mesoamerican uh, mean. Uh, that is also like an interesting uh, thing uh, to think on because these guys, while they were teaching, they were teaching simultaneously, probably, <laughs> Spanish, Latin, uh, the Italian uh, uh, language that they were using at that time, to people who spoke Nahuatl and Totonaca and uh, Mixteco, as I was saying. Uh, so that must be like a really interesting time uh, for, for education. This was made in, in Mexico City. Uh, is, a, is a fragment from the Maclevecano Codex uh, made between 1529 and 1553. Then we have uh, more formal documents like this one, that it, these two, that is the foundation decrees that was signed by Joanna of Castile, mother of Charles I, or as we know it in Spanish, Carlos V. Sí, como chocolate. Um, y, and that uh, they were like, uh, the foundation of two or the, of the first three cities in Mexico. The first three cities in Mexico were, of course, Mexico City, then Tlaxcala, and then Puebla. Uh, this was made uh, in Madrid and in Valladolid in 1535 and 1538. And you can see the rotunda uh, used in the text uh, and, and all its splendor. This is also a foundation a document for, for the city of Puebla. It's when uh, in 1576, uh, it gained the titles of noble and loyal, uh, la más noble y leal ciudad de Los Angeles. Uh, actually, Puebla, the original name of Puebla, the, the, like the complete name of the city is Puebla de Los Angeles or Puebla of the Angels. But the, the original name of this city is uh, Ciudad de Los Angeles. So we have a Los Angeles here also, but it's not named there uh, that anymore. Oh, well, 
Uh, there's also this, this another example from uh, 1569. It's, a, it's a, a fragment of the Florentine Codex, uh, also known as the general history of the things that happened in the New Spain, written by Bernardino de Sagún and the Tlaquilos from Tlatelolco and Texcoco. Tlatelolco and Texcoco were the first two uh, schools where the Tlaquilos became scribes. And uh, there are a lot of documentation when they, when the, the Spaniards and the Italians are amazed on how the Mesoamerican uh, scribes learned uh, so fast the alphabet. I mean, it's, it's probably uh, easier to make uh, one or two strokes to form a letter than to draw an entire character. This is from uh, 15, this was made between 1550 and 1564. Uh, this is the uh, Sierra Teixupan Codex. It was made uh, in, in, the, in, in Oaxaca. And it, this was an accountant, uh, an accountant book uh, for expenses. Uh, what, what I like about this example is that you can see how uh, that is black letter rotunda, but it's also not, pretending to be like a title or, or like a formal uh, uh, ornament thing, ornamental thing. It's more like just plain writing, you know? Plain writing with rotunda, rotunda style. And of course the tilde, the end tilde of años, is like really interesting, like, a, like an elbow or something. Uh, this is the, from 1611, uh, the libro, the, the choir book, made by Luis Lagarto in Puebla for the uh, Archidiocesis of Puebla Tlaxcala, and now it resides in like, the cathedral, the Puebla Cathedral. But well, that's, uh, simultaneously as this was happening about the calligraphy and the teaching of, of calligraphy and writing, the first types uh, came to, to America, because of course uh, it is uh, notable to, to think that the first uh, printing types came to, to, to Mexico City and uh, for a, a very long time, it was the only city uh, that had uh, printing types. Event eventually it had a, a little bit of, of type founding. Um, there was like this uh, kind of weird relation between New Spain and Spain because uh, you have to picture that the, the, the Spanish empire in that time, it was so huge. So most of the types were not made in Spain, were imported from, from Belgium and from France. Uh, apparently the Spaniards didn't have much time to, to develop types. They were uh, a little distracted, like conquering and stuff. Uh, this is from 1941. Uh, it's printed by Giovanni Paoli. Uh, and it's it's a funny thing because I, I tried to find a good digitized version of the Doctrina Cristiana that is supposed to be the first uh, book printed in, in the Americas, but I couldn't find a, a good one. Instead, I found this, that it's uh, a, a, a news, a, a, little, a little bit of a newspaper. It's uh, about uh, an earthquake that happened in Guatemala. Uh, literally, it says uh, in the in the second page of the right, uh, memory of what happened in Guatemala. No? Uh, it's interesting because there were like these three three big names in the first printing efforts in in, in Mexico. One is Giovanni Paoli or Juan Pablos, also uh, name uh, known as Juan Pablos. Uh, but of course, we have to to talk about Antonio Espinosa and this uh, 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 Misal from uh, 1561 um, uh, that's made of course in, in Rotunda. And uh, this is also made by Pedro Ocharte, uh, also using probably like the same uh, typeface of, of Rotunda. You can uh, also see that uh, the, the, the shapes of the Rotunda were uh, so weird of, of of time, uh, it's not like a sharp uh, uh, figure, but because uh, it was used over and over 
So uh, I'm trying to say that the, the, the frequency of acquiring new typefaces in the first probably 100 years of the printing types in Mexico uh, was not the, from the best quality. Now we move to uh, 19, uh, the, to the 19th century, and this is uh, a book of rhetoric lessons. This was printed in Puebla. Puebla was uh, famous during the six, during the 19th century because it had a lot of, of uh, schools and colleges, and they had lessons, and they needed to print their own uh, study material. Uh, this is probably one of the imports of, of uh, the Caslon uh, text uh, typeface. Uh, there are two main uh, um, like uh, type founders material that came to Puebla, specifically to Puebla. And one was from the Plantan uh, foundry and the other one was from Caslon. I mean, of course, separated like 100 years or two 100 years uh, from each other. But you can actually find uh, many uh, books printed locally without that kind of, of, of printings of, of types. Um, and of course, well, uh, I want to, to take a little uh, space to talk about the special collections that are in Puebla. This is not the, the only collections that are in Mexico. There are other uh, really uh, interesting collections, for example, the Biblioteca Nacional that it's inside uh, uh, the Autonomous National University of Mexico, la UNAM, uh, and uh, la Biblioteca de Burgoa Library in Oaxaca, for example. But uh, these are like the two collections that I have been working uh, on the past years from first hand. And this one, uh, the first one is uh, la, de la Fragua, la Fragua Special Collections is uh, our ancient uh, library uh, from the university. Uh, this is a breviario romano uh, from France from the 14th century. Uh, there's not, it's not been possible to, to date it like uh, correctly, but this is like the most uh, near we have. Apparently, this is the oldest or the ancient, uh, the, the oldest, the oldest manuscript that we have in, in Mexico. But uh, I'm saying apparently because uh, I don't really have the, the, the certainty. We can also find uh, inside the Biblioteca Palafoxiana uh, some incunabula printed by uh, Nicolas Jensen, like this uh, City of Goth uh, from Venice, printed in 1475, uh, again, Rotunda. This actually, talks about that the first printings in Mexico uh, used like typefaces uh, that were in the market like 60 or 70 years before. Of course, uh, one of the main uh, uh, attractions of the Biblioteca Palafoxiana is uh, it's a copy of the Liber Chronicarum or the Nuremberg Chronicles printed by Anton Korberg and uh, it was, it, it's a, a really interesting book uh, that shows uh, at least seven different styles of black letter. This book uh, must have like a, a, a it, it's a must to look at when you study black letters. Um, of course, many of these are, are, are type, are metal type, but some of them are uh, uh, plates of, of engraving, of wood engraving. Well, then I go, I want to go back to, to the calligraphy thing uh, and to mention the influence of the speedball manual uh, and how calligraphy can be depicted as lettering. Of course, uh, the speedball manual uh, became really popular in Mexico uh, during the first half of the, of the 20th century. Funny thing is that many sign painters have their own copies of this speedball manual, but they never actually updated it. So it's really common to, to talk with a sign painter, probably 60 or 70 years old, and he keeps 
the same uh, speedball manual that uh, was uh, uh, from his young age or probably from his father. It's like a really uh, interesting thing because uh, those shapes were like uh, like encapsulated in, in time, no? And well, this is one of the of the of the examples from. Uh, I think this is a manual from 1952, mm -hmm. and it's most of what you can see in 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 the streets. No, it's like a like a version of uh, or interpretation, uh, uh, some sort of of rendition of of the black letters, but with a lot of uh, with a lot of of spiciness. Uh, actually, in 2006, Cristina Paoli uh, published this this book, Mexican Black Letter, that is uh, a must have to to understand uh, visually how how these uh, environments affect us, uh, and it's a, a a really good thing to to keep in mind because well, uh, this takes mostly in Mexico City, but uh, when you compare it to what happens in Puebla or in Tlaxcala. It's practically the same. This kind of reinterpretation of what are supposed to be uh, black letters. And the the third uh, calligraphy like phenomenon, if you want to to say that, of influence, the third wave of influence of calligraphy in black letter forms, uh, of course, must be addressed to the Chicano culture. Uh, where the letter forms became roots of identity. As I was uh, showing you uh, in some slides before, uh, the black letter in Mexico means or has uh, like some kind of regal origins, like a formal thing, like I think from the past, like from, from a past when, when, when Mexico as the new Spain was part of something bigger, like uh, I don't know if this makes sense, but became something of uh, almost royalty thing. No? So when you want to be attached to something like that, and if you cross it with a religious thing, it becomes something else when you are out of, of, of Mexico. Uh, around the 1920s, uh, the, the immigration uh, phenomenon uh, in the in the border of between Mexico and, and the United States created a lot of of new. I don't like the word subculture. I, I don't like the, the the concept of subculture because I think that culture is just culture. Because if there is a subculture, then there's a superculture, and I don't. I really don't like that. But the culture of the Pachucas, for example that uh, it was an influence from uh, all the way down and back, uh, a lot of music and, and the, the style and movies uh, from the 1940s and 50s in, in Mexico uh, had a lot of this influence. And for some reason, the black letters started to appear also in there. But it's not, the, well, Ciudad Juarez is in the, uh, eastern coast uh, is the eastern side of, of the border, of course. The 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 uh, well, uh, that's what it says, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. But also from the other side of, of the coast, uh, uh, in in California, in Southern California, the the Cholo movement that apparently uh, it's so intertwined with the black letter. Uh, environment as something that could be a reminder of what was the idealized uh, Mexico from the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and this na nowadays this is translated to, to tattoos and to something like a, almost like a fashion thing. Uh, but it's interesting to see how these Mexicans are Mexicans who have been in Mexico uh, and how the Mexicans in Mexico, are, we get embedded from that uh, culture and we share a lot. Uh, as, as, I, as I was saying, and I insist, this phenomenon is uh, two, ways, uh, two ways around. 
uh, the inference is also uh, in that in that uh, in that sense. Well, this is a, a really famous uh, Chicano Park in, in San Diego, uh, where the sense of belonging to your family, to your past, to to uh, to your culture, uh, is really uh, connected to the presence of the black letter. And when we see this, you can know how far it has come. Because it's not just merely the shapes or it's, this is not European anymore. This is, this is something different. This is not new because this has been taken, as I said in the, uh, at the beginning of the talk, has been taking shape for the past five centuries. Uh, so I don't know if this is really new. It's been there all the time uh, and it's going to stay. I also want to take a shout out uh, to the influence of the street art. Uh, this is uh, Mendes Allen, an artist from the Estado de Mexico or uh, the state of Mexico, it's weird to say it in English. Uh, that from the 2013, he has developing a style uh, he called it a uh, uh, caco. <laughs> Wait, this is a, 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 a difficult word for me. It's caco <laughs> calitlaquilografia. That's how he calls it. Uh, he, he calls that this is like, as calligraphy is writing right, this is like writing wrong, no? Uh, and he takes out the shapes of, of the black letter and turns it into, into something else. Of course, uh, Mendes Allen is not the only uh, urban artist that makes this. This is just like one example. But I think it's really interesting that that what sometimes we can think of uh, border culture is actually Mexican culture as well. So to close up this, uh, this lecture, I want to uh, just take a, 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 a little note to the Mexican black letter design, because there are a, a lot of efforts from different type designers from all over the country on making uh, black letters on their own catalogs. I know that many people or, or many uh, designers or even uh, educators of design think that uh, Drawing black letters makes not much sense because it's not that commercial. But I really, uh, I'm really glad that uh, Mexican type designers uh, are interested in that, and I'm pretty sure that they they have this uh, same the same background or are at least a really similar background uh, to mine because the interest of, of making these, these shapes, these new shapes from old traditions uh, is there. No? So we have a lot of, of examples like from Gabriel Martinez Meave Darca, Armando Pineda Tosca, Manuel López Rocha Gorgias, Jonathan Corvo Corbus, Frida Medrano Javín, that you saw in the, in the previous slide. Of course, we have the work of José Luis Coyotl, uh, Conchamuco, uh, Miguel Reyes and his, um, his Canela Black Letter, Cristóbal Enestrosa, and one of the, of the weights of, of Espinosa Nova, uh, uh, Mascleta and Miguel Ángel Contreras. Uh, and, uh, well, you can see the name. This is from, also from Eduardo Aire, Monica Munguía, Pepe Tzintzun, Ricardo Castellanos, and Jorge Mercado. And well, what I think what it's more interesting for me and appealing, of course, is that it's been a long way uh, from considering uh, what we see in the streets as a vernacular thing, as, as text. It's a long way away from just the vernacular. Because the letter from culture and the letter from environments affects us and shapes what is inside of our minds, even when we don't notice how many 
uh, inferences or references or subtle inductions we have, we carry on our daily thinking. And well, that was Goticas Mexicanas. Uh, that's the only thing, the only way we can call it. And we must celebrate it. So thank you. Amazing, amazing. Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's so interesting to, to see and hear, and I really appreciate the the, the breadth of the talk and, and the incredible context that you shared, not just like the visual material, but also like the fuller, fuller picture around it. So thank you. Um, I also appreciate the idea that, that you mentioned about the like culture being culture, you know, and I, th I think it's kind of important to talk about just, just in the context of where we are, but like, and, and connecting to, to the ending kind of, uh, of, of your talk about the vernacular and, and, you know, I, I, I certainly personally agree and just in, in that there's a lot of culture, of course, there's like these, these, um, layers of it, but, uh, as a as an archivist or kind of as a as a as someone who kind of sees the history through the documents we have i tend to sigh on on this this idea of um that things are things and they help study history and of course it's helpful to have categories and genres and classifications but sometimes it makes it much messier and and it's almost better just accept like the 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 messiness of it and and, and everything and just mm -hmm. consider it as a whole history i think like we're better off kind of learning more and sort of seeing these things and i do also appreciate like the 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 like your 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 idea the thought that you left us with like the the vernacular kind of moving into um um out of sort of the labels of vernacular and kind of being very much like an ever present uh, uh, object. So super, super interesting. Um, uh, we're gonna take a few questions. Um, if, if there's something that you'd like to ask that, that um, you haven't um, had a chance to type up, folks, please uh, feel free to use the, the Q&A window, um, send us questions in there because if you send it in the chat, we might um, lose it in, in, in the, um, amazing cascade of, of applause for, for Jesus, which I add very much to. Um, I, I'll ask, I guess, a, a question from Adriana, um, asking um, personally, why, you, why um, do you think that Mexico uh, embraced the black letter more than other calligraphic styles? Well, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's weird because I think that the key word is nostalgia. Uh, it's it's interesting because nostalgia can get us like a, a, in in so many unexpected ways. And as I was saying, I think that uh, we have this uh, longing for the past, but the past is is imaginary. The past probably doesn't exist because we have we all have uh, different versions of what we think the past is, but. Apparently, the past is always better, and uh, and I think that this royalty thing that the black letter bring to 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 our uh, culture during the the 16th century, it kind of got stuck in in our minds, in our imaginary, and, and you don't even notice that. Uh, Actually, when you when you travel to to churches uh, in the uh, central area of Mexico. There are a lot of places with black letters as a almost as a religious uh, thing. So you you uh, you see the Bible and Jesus and the figures and well the the the, the saints and stuff with the, their names in, in black letters. So it also gives it like a, a like a spiritual kind of of vibe. Uh, but it's it's weird. I I couldn't be able to explain it. Not not to explain it, but to prove it. I don't have any any way to prove it. This is just a hunch. But uh, I think that that's like the main thing. That there's like so many uh, insightful uh, phenomena working with culture that you don't even 
realize uh, this is not what you are doing like on purpose. Uh, of course, uh, Adriana, uh, hi Adriana, Adriana Garcia Duenas, uh, she also makes uh, good, uh, pretty, pretty good black letters. I mentioned some some of the of the designers that I found, but there are a lot of, of Mexicans interested in, in this in calligraphy, but also in, in doing type type design. And uh, I don't know, it's uh, I don't, I don't want to call it like like that, but I think that black letter is probably a more Mexican thing now than it is European, uh, because the time turns things around uh, in unexpected ways, no. Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's like it's it's fascinating how with with time passing which is of course like super logical it makes sense like the references that people have to a certain visual changes you know for yeah, 100 200 years ago like that style evoked something different like if you if you see it uh today it has a connection to a different time a different place it's just the relationship of how much time and how much exposure you have and so it's it's no longer medieval european it's it's becoming something much more of a everyday or kind of maybe historically that like of your parents grandparents it becomes completely regional in a way that just completes it morphs and and that that's kind of wonderful to think about culture moving and, and and shifting in history just kind of continuing um thank you adriana for for that question um there was another question that was interesting um um in terms of like the training you you brought up the idea of speedball and how influential those books have been you know it's like a great marketing um technique um the company speedball who's making nibs for for the calligraphy pens created the series of books to kind of teach people how to use them they're incredible because they're um even though they're published in the states they, they had a pretty significant reach and, and what's wonderful about the illustrations that ross f george made for them is they're incredibly easy to follow i mean I say that like the illustrations are easy to follow. I think actually doing the the calligraphy writing using the requires a bit of training, <laughs> a little bit of technique, but with with sort of the instructions. And I posted in the chat letter from archive uh, in San Francisco has a collection of drawings that Ross F. George made for those plates. So you kind of really see the 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 retouching and everything, but. Those books were really incredibly influential on in how people could pick up. You can go to the store, art store, buy the nibs, buy the buy the buy the ink, and then just study the book and practice, practice, and you could get relatively good. Um, Lona uh, Lee's question was sort of um, in in and I'll broaden it, but her question is: um, uh, Where did the lettering artists in Puebla and the surrounding states get their training from? Is lettering taught as a craft, or is there formal training? So again, like focusing in Puebla, but also in Mexico, what what besides the speedball books, what else um, kind of training would would sign writers receive? Yeah, well, uh, as I said, uh, the like the, the local uh, term for that is uh, rotulistas or rotulus. Uh, they are the, the people who are specialized on, on making this. Uh, uh, this, uh, I, as I said, lettering and sign painting, and they train their own uh, employees. So it's more like a master and apprentice uh, uh, kind of, of practice. And they use, of course, uh, they they inspire their characters in, in the in the books like like the Speedball. Uh, funny thing is that uh, most of the Speedball uh, manuals that they, they have are like uh, like photocopies, like zero zero Xerox photocopies that they have like the past twenty or thirty years, all yellow and and dusty. Uh, but they hold on to that. Uh, so that's like the the artisan. Uh, thing to 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 the, the artisan way to do it, but there's also like an interest in in, in recent years in, in academia of course in, in in graphic design courses in bachelor's degrees uh, in in Puebla in, in Mexico City uh, in Veracruz in Oaxaca and many in Guadalajara there's a, a really uh, big movement in there uh, and it's kind of weird because it's like graphic designers and type designers like uh, somewhat invading the the artistry of of these uh, rotulistas but there's a there's a space to to share because uh, rotulistas mostly are uh, aware 
that the technology and the times uh, are changing and they need to learn uh, this, uh, specifically these new technologies that graphic designers have uh, a natural training for. So there's been like a, this really interesting phenomenon because uh, designers uh, that have like formal studies are learning the craft from the practitioners and the practic practitioners are like having uh, some sort of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, actualization with this, this kind uh, of, of, uh, of things. Uh, it, knows, it doesn't always uh, ends up well. There are some people who are like jealous that they don't want to share the secrets or don't want to share clients. But uh, that is uh, almost like a uh, rare thing. There's a lot of, of understanding between those two phases of, of, the, of the practice. And I'm really glad because this is like the perfect time to learn from them because many of the rotulistas are like really, really old people. And uh, they were, mostly of them are, are kind of worried that their uh, practice disappear because it gets lost. So it's time for us in the academia to, to take back that knowledge and to, to save it. Because as, as I said in the presentation, I think that they uh, hold like the 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 information or the or the models that are now part of, of our culture it could be like a really uh, sad thing to to for those to get lost yeah yeah i think it's it's i think we're seeing a resurgence and and i think also just more publishing too like smaller publishing i, I within the type and lettering community um there's a lot more interest in kind of publishing things and, and capturing some of this history that's that's being uh produced and in, in, in places um let me see if there's um there's quite a few questions in here i want to see if um uh um hopefully we can get through all of the questions um this is, this is a question that came in earlier, but um, maybe interesting just to kind of um, uh, any connections between Mexican black letter and Tex-Mex border culture, heavily German influence, including the music. I would imagine so, right? It's like the influence of. Uh, it's it's really, uh, it's nice. It's really nice to, to think. I know that that's what excites me more, more stuff about, about culture, because there are a lot of things around. And once you start to connect the dots, then everything makes sense. Of course, there is a lot of, of, of German uh, music uh, imbued in the in the northern uh, culture. I actually find it uh, really interesting how the south of the US and the north of Mexico have a lot of, of, of things in common in clothing, in music, in the way to speak, in some even some words. Uh, and that that doesn't like uh, gets uh, only there in the north. It, it all, always comes down to, to the rest of the country. Uh, maybe except for the Yucatan Peninsula, those guys really are unreachable uh, in, in terms of, of the, the northern culture. But uh, for example, uh, the, the Norteño music or the mariachi uh, or the, uh, the past years uh, uh, that have been like uh, a really popular thing about the Dia de Muertos, probably for the, because of the Pixar movie and, and stuff. It's interesting to see how it's like a, like some ping pong game because everything comes there and then comes back and then goes there and then comes back. Uh, I wouldn't let any influence out of what is uh, this process of, of inculturization. Uh, and of course, there must be a link there also in the letter form uh, culture. Uh, I think there's almost anything happens by chance. There are a lot of, of, of reasons why you, you uh, find the right track to follow. And, uh, and yeah, of course, I think it's, it's, it's great. There is a, 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 like a style of music that it's called uh, like uh, Pachuco music. That is like a, a, a mix between uh, boogie boogie. Uh, uh, I, how, how do they call these guys? Uh, the oh, I, I just forgot the, the word. Uh, uh, but it's it can be traced back to the fifties, to the nineteen fifties. So it was like a 
like a thing, uh, rockabilly. The rockabilly, mm -hmm. there's a lot of Mexican surf rockabilly uh, in Spanglish, and it, it resonates in both sides of the border. And I think that's that's just magical. No? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, let's see, there's a question. Uh, Craig Elias, and uh, European black letter style, particularly as regimented into metal type, if so, even tight, grid-like. Um, it's wonderful to see those letter from particularly in Mexican sign painting uh, to get put onto curved baseline, spaced out, generally loosened up, you know, so like the rigidity kind of gets gets changed. Any thoughts about how your local digital type um, uh, take works to capture the loosening up scene in the local quote unquote vernacular? Yeah, I think that uh, specifically in 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 my in, in my work, uh, it's it's kind of been a, a process of uh, Craig just nails it with the, with the with the concept of loosen loosen it up. I, I need to to loose. Uh, to relax a lot of of my even my 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 way of thinking, because when when you get trained as a graphic designer, at least in Mexico, they they teach you that the standard should be like this really flat and clean design, like probably the international uh, how is it said the international style from the fifties and style, yeah. yes 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 and. Uh, and now we can see this kind of of, of uh, things when when brands rebrand to uh, uh, to a sensory and the Swiss style and, and stuff. And of course, we are trained like that because that's the basis in in some way. But then you just walk out to the street and you see this messiness around, this vibe, this uh, fully colorful, uh, alive uh, streets. And you shouldn't be like uh, away from that. Uh, so probably what what is more difficult for me is has been to 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 get loose. You know? uh, I saw also a question over there about the ecstasy typeface. It's I think it's kind of stiffer than I would like to be, uh, but I think that's that's the key. We should like get loose. We should use more colors. We should. Uh, uh, place the 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 uh, I don't know how to say it like the the things that now we see as vernacular we should like extract the things to find probably what should be the Mexican design I mean I don't aspire for for my design to look uh, Swiss because because it will never look Swiss as much as I try there's going to be always that that piece of evidence that uh, tells that you are not what you are trying to to be, and that's like a also like a really hard hard uh, way to to live to, to try to 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 be something else or to appear like something else. And um, I I am working uh, probably the last the past two years I have been working in a collection of of uh, fonts based on this because well uh this uh my approach to the mexican black letter has been like really natural i would never even occur to me that this would be like a research uh, subject and a design search uh, research subject but uh, uh it keeps it, it kept uh, popping up and then I, I decided okay let's let's get the black letter uh, flow and uh, and then I have been working in a collection. It, it's our, our 10, 10 type faces based on the letter forms. It's not a copy, of course. Uh, it's a process similar to what, what I did with ecstasy, but now not now in the in the in uh, over the sketch of, of a famous designer, but now it's made on what I see in the streets and what I like or what I find interesting in the streets. So I have in the process, I, I do have like the, the calligraphy models ready and I'm started to, to draw the, the actual typefaces. And uh, I don't know if, if they're going to be yes, to commercial uh, successful or not, probably never going to buy it. I will probably just release it for, for, for free. Uh, but the, the interesting th thing is that uh, you can learn a lot of, of 
uh, letting those influences uh, get into your work, and I really, I'm really enjoying it. It's a, it's a really, really interesting, like kind of um, range. Um, it's picking up on that, um, there's a question relating a little bit to what you were talking about, kind of this this um, dominant kind of. Um, um, kind of some, sometimes maybe overbearing, but certainly kind of a, a dominant um, design heritage from, from the international typographic style, kind of this, this modernism kind of looms o- across the, the world and global design. But uh, there's a question from um, Ilkia Acosta. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but the question is, do you have um, any other Latinx contemporary designers, type designers, studios, or designers that you think we should know of. It's always been, uh, it's always been uh, something I wanted to support as someone that went to a very Swiss approach design program in my undergraduate. Um, uh, I always wanted to find someone I could identify a bit more culturally coming from uh, Salvadoran, Honduran uh, roots, but growing up in New Jersey. And you, you, you had a uh, quite a few slides um, at the end of your talk showing um, uh, um, Latin uh, and, and, and kind of Mexican, Central American and South American uh, type designers. But is there, um, I know there's quite a few conferences, Tipo Latinos, there's, there's uh, La Trastica, but what, what's a good place for people to find uh, more, more information kind of to follow? You know, uh, now that I'm thinking of it, I think that there is not a particular source that I could cite, but that's a good opportunity to, to make one, to, to start one. Because yeah, there, there is like, a, that, you know, that, that's, that's what, what's wrong with it, sometimes with the concept of vernacular, because it, it kind of passes out uh, to your head. Uh, you kind of underestimate that. And it's like, oh no, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, we should focus on something else. But I think that what uh, Ilkia is, is, uh, is asking for, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, thing to, to, to make or to do, because there are a lot of, of uh, if not designers, but artists uh, that have been doing work about around this. Uh, but of course, uh, we should like, Keep a, a more uh, a more keen uh, track on onto this. This is really interesting. Also, the the influence on the on the on the Central American culture from from Mexico and from the United States is also really really present. And uh, uh, the you, you mentioned uh, of course tipos Latinos the 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 biennial tipos Latinos. I think that's a, a good place to follow what is being done in Latin America. Uh, of course, uh, I have lately having trouble with the, with the works that look just like any other uh, typeface made out of Latin America. I mean, I'm not saying that typefaces should have like sombreros and, and, and maracas, and, but there's have, there has to be something there different, uh, but you can find like a really nice, diverse, uh, uh, group on in, in every selection uh, every year. Uh, the things that, for example, uh, Brazilian designers are doing, it's it's amazing because I think that they are coming to to an equilibrium of what is uh, like globally accepted, uh, but what is locally influenced, and that's uh, I think that's something to admire. Uh, but yeah, uh, I also think that. Uh, you, you mentioned it, the Trastic, of course. Uh, they, they are like really, really into the. Uh, it, it is a conference, but it's also a community. So that's like the, the most interesting part. They have a, a community in Facebook. Uh, I know that Facebook uh, is not the most popular uh, social network uh, these days, but it's really practical to, to make these groups to be alive. So it's, it's interesting because. Of course, when when you have uh, like the a, a type create or a, a, you take a workshop and you do it with uh, with people who has these strong uh, influences, of course they are going to convey that to you, and that's what we need, I think, uh, locally uh, to to understand to find uh, just like like he he was or she I don't know, uh, like Ilkia is uh, is telling about. 
and to find the David Carsons or the Paula Shares or, or the Zach Meisters of, of the Mexican culture, uh, not because of pain, but because of the work. Uh, because you can tell, you can tell when a designer, a Dutch designer makes something, you can say, say that looks Dutch or that looks uh, British. Uh, I, I aspire to, to, to one day to say, to see something and say that looks Mexican, but without the sombrero, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. No, there, then I think like the, the community is growing and I, I think like um, that th- it, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's learning and then teaching and sort of tr- transmitting that is what's go- going to grow and, and, and excel the community and kind of uh, create more pathways for people to, to, to be inspired and, and, and work sort of within those. And so I think just, just one, like having a conversation like this here is incredibly eye opening, I think for a lot of folks, because it creates the opportunity for people to recognize something that they haven't really thought about. So, it, it, and then it leads to um, connections. I mean, People are sharing Instagram accounts in the chat. So that's like using sort of the global network of, of social media for, for connections and finding things and, and keeping inspired and, and creative sort of personal um, uh, lenses that kind of open up. But it's, it's really interesting to, to, to think about what um, um, typefaces and kind of designing typefaces there's always the pressure of commercial and and kind of the global pressure of like you want to design something that will sell because you know you're spending so much time and effort and making something you want to make sure it sells you don't want it maybe to be too too unusual so that like but but i i hear you about the that sort of flavor that when you look at a typeface you can kind of tell that it's 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 coming from a particular place and that's the kind of incredible to see that and and it's 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 great to to be able to see that of course in the vernacular but then also to kind of start to see it in in the in the type design that's being made um let's see we have maybe a couple of minutes um there's a question um i guess more of a open-ended question from Francois, uh, Francois Chastanet, um, whose book has been mentioned a couple of times uh, in, in the chat about Chola writing. Uh, Francois uh, um, writing speedball manuals are central in the influence, still working on Chola writing connections and sources on my side. It appears that Benton's fonts like engravers Old English and Wedding Text Decorative texturists linked with older Caslan type in, in, from England are more influential sources than Rotondas in Rotolista's production and gang graffiti in LA South uh, and Southwest. Any comments? So, like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have, I have to check that about uh, Benton's. I, it may make sense that uh, Benton work uh, is uh, is influence uh, in in that, those areas. But I do agree about the Caslan text. I I have this is like a pending research that I have because uh, I have like a, a collection probably like I don't know like three or four hundred now like four hundred pictures of of uh, of sign painting and letterings from the region of Puebla of black letters, and I'm starting to see that the the Caslan text specifically the lowercase a repeats in most of them so there's a connection of course there uh, i don't know uh, if uh, if uh, in some point uh, a, a lettering manual took the castle text because you know something that also reminds me of the commentary of craig Harrison is that uh, many of the of the calligraphy manuals are actually inspired in typefaces in metal typefaces so it creates like a weird uh, adaptation because of course you cannot do exactly the same with with the with the pen that you do uh, in in drawing the typeface. So I don't know exactly how I'm going to to find that uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, the cue to, to 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 follow. But I do feel that uh, the 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 main influence could be Caslon text. The the thing to answer is if it's based on printing types or if it's based on a shape drawn after the printing types. That's what would be like my most uh, mysterious thing to to uncover. But 
Yeah, uh, you know, uh, also the the digital uh, typefaces, the digital versions of uh, old English text, for example, it's been uh, like a like a key uh, uh, element on the reconstruction of this black letter uh, culture. For example, uh, in tattoos, there are a lot of people who are tattooed with all English text. Why? Because all English text is in the in the in the computer, and then the tattoo artist from probably twenty years ago was easier to make uh, to write the 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 name or or the phrase to print it and to copy it. But now it it changes the materiality. It doesn't. It's it's not all English text anymore. It's like a something uh, something different. And I have seen old English text also in a lot of uh, car uh, car painting, like this detailing of, of uh, ornaments in, in cars, mainly f- of course of the of the cholo thing. And there are a lot of of now like fashion brands that are making like caps and t-shirts and sweatshirts, uh, like with cholo inspira- inspiration. But they use also the digital version of old English text, and it's it's peculiar, but. Uh, I think that 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 would be like a really good uh, thing to start. And uh, now uh, I, I agree with with, with Francois. I have to, to take a look, a deeper look to Kazan text. And now you just gave me the the cue, so thank you. <laughs> there's there's a lot of interest. I mean, like the, there's a book that we recently acquired. I posted in chat called Heated Words. Um, it's a book published by Rizzoli about. Um, it's called the sub sub. Uh, title searching for mysterious typeface it's a felt letters like iron on letter forms that were very popular in the 70s and 80s and they became very um ubiquitous in the visual kind of um uh, hip hop culture, but everything um, around the hip hop culture. So um, local, and and so you can just go to the store and buy these kind of felt letters. But it became um, became a, an associative kind of tactic, and and people could very easily make their own shirts kind of uh, alignment. So there's this like interesting, and and a lot of that is is very much kind of that old English kind of a, a single stylized um, black letter kind of through a hybrid and kind of moving through. So as you said, like there's this connection to fashion that happens quite a bit. And to to that end, um, uh, Adria Robles uh, asked, do you think we will ever see a political campaign in Mexico <laughs> using black letter? <laughs> does it tip? I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, but hopefully. I hope <laughs> someone gets a divine inspiration and see the potential of how this uh, religious slash uh, regal slash formal slash epic slash gang uh, style of the black letter could could bring. I, I don't see it happening, but I don't see why they, they shouldn't because, well, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the political campaigns are a uh, whole uh, subject and how, how the, the political marketers or designers make things. Uh, I, I don't, I, as I said, I, I don't think so, but I hope someone would do that, uh, even if they lose. <laughs> but they should do. They should do it. We have a lot of 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 uh, of, of uh, land to 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 uncover. So I like that. Yeah, I, I I just saw that that question before you read it, and I was like, yeah, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's you know like a lot of the old um uh graffiti kind of the the ancient roman graffiti uh, uh was public kind of uh, electioneering slogans and so you know why not mm-hmm. that legacy of the roman cap morphing into all all of the things eventually into black letter you know kind of bring it back all the way to the yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the source of the other hand yeah and and the thing is that uh, uh, politics always try to like to be in apparently to be in touch or related to with the people, and I think that letter form should be uh, could be like a really good uh, place to start. I mean, uh, I I of course I am I I, I like a lot uh, Gotham and the work of of Tobias and and, and stuff, but. Uh, Sadly, since uh, the Obama administration got Gotham, at least in Mexico, 
every campaign tries to make like an Obama like campaign and it's always it's always super boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Laurie Laurie in, in chat brought up a, a note about like the 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 sort of the Nazi use of of black letter of course which which closely kind of aligns with politics and so there's always that 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 red flag potentially. <laughs> Bring, you know, it's politics you know it might look a certain way but that that's a fair <laughs> um, yeah well yeah <laughs> yeah um um let's see um i think we have maybe like time for one one more uh question i'm gonna see and he says if you see anything that you would like to take um uh, there's there's a lot of really good stuff that came in i think we covered most of them um there was one question there are a couple of linked questions uh let me find it uh, uh ah ah yeah Jordan, uh, he asked well Jordan asked uh, are there specific characters that you find particularly challenging to create in black letter style conversely are there specific characters do you really enjoy working on and uh, uh, Danny Elrich uh, asked uh, that if there are particular letter forms that I enjoy working on uh, to add the Mexican influence. Uh, there are some more challenging than others. I think that the, the most uh, fun is in the uppercase uh, letters because what I have seen uh, in the many examples of black letter is that the... <laughs> the uppercase can be like the most free, the most uh, imaginable things. Uh, and there are, of course, some decisions to, to take, for example, with the letters E and F that are uh, not uh, traditionally squared in black letter, but in these mixed uh, styles, they do. Uh, but I also enjoy a lot of, of, uh, of, of the work when doing the 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 diacritics on the tilde and the accents because they can be like more calligraphy-esque so they can be like more pointy or or straight even or in a different way and that looks really great and that's something that you wouldn't do for example to a sans serif or to a traditional serif uh, text typeface and uh, there's like a, a really space on, on doing that kind of work uh, the also the endings of the descenders, for example, the G or the Y, uh, lowercase, it gives you like the opportunity to make a lot of swashes, and it's natural. It's natural for those uh, kind of shapes to make those swashes, and of course to make uh, alternates, no contextual alternates to make like some of the of the. Uh, uh, of the parts like longer and more expressive. Uh, I think that uh, those are like opportunities that no other uh, style, perhaps uh, other calligraphic styles like uh, like uh, cancillary or cancellaresca uh, can make. But uh, it's really interesting to make it because uh, it's most of a free style kind of design and then uh, things start to to pop uh, like really really right away and another amazing thing about designing black letters is that uh, the the spacing is almost uh, instantaneous you don't have to spend so much time because the the shapes make the work for you that's amazing <laughs> instruction allows for for that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to do well um let's see we might have time for one um one more question i think um uh i think it was more I, there was one that was sort of a little bit more more open-ended which i you you start, touched on in, in your talk but like um uh Kat, uh uh how do you see mexican black letter evolve in the future for example under the influence of the sign painter slanting the letters being creative and making um making them their own do you see this evolve in a new kind of letter form in the future that might be kind of a good closing question like where do you see the potential evolution for the style in, in the future in mexico or outside 
Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, I I didn't want to to like to make so much emphasis in that, but there was a particularly uh, slide that I would like to to recall. That is the one with the yellow background. When I said it was the chicken butcher shop, uh, there's a perfect example of how you can be. Uh, unfaithful or uh, disrespectful to what a uh, black letter should be, but still have rules. And that is really interesting. The, the batard, the backslanted uh, with, the, with the shadow, uh, because of course, when the, when the rotulista traced that in the, in the wall, he did it with a free spirit, but with a, a structured uh, way of working. And I think I think that's something that we should pay attention to when we look at these uh, uh, environments of, of black letters in the streets and in, in everywhere. I have seen at least 20, probably, uh, styles that can be uh, like rationalized on to create something, I don't want to say formal book because this is anything but formal, but uh, but but structured, and of course, uh, for me, the the way is through calligraphy and then type design. But it shouldn't be necessarily like that. You can like start to to sketch or to draw or to make uh, letter forms uh, with that kind of of uh, of uh, of logic. You know that this exercise of the the type cooker. Uh, that uh, it's uh, about the like the the recipe. It's interesting because these guys, these rotulistas, have been using those recipes like probably the the past forty years, not without knowing it, but uh, with a different approach. And I think that's something uh, to follow and to experiment. Uh, I don't know if that's the future. That's maybe the present. That's even what is there already. Uh, but I, I also, I will always appreciate uh, what can we learn from that. And as an educator, of course, uh, my goal is going to be to bring those kind of, 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 uh, of uh, like, uh, uh, like conditions or, or characteristics to, to my classes to, to convey to the students because uh, it's also a great creative uh, exercise to to imagine uh, if 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 we can do that to something so stiff as the black letter, then we can do anything. Yeah, although well, that's that's a really really great thought to leave people with, and so I I think this idea of of you know learning and teaching and and I, we hope that these lectures can provide that opportunity for people to kind of get in, in, in inspired um or at least just being uh curious about something new and then who knows what kind of uh, ideas open up there's an incredible creative force out there everyone um has so much potential and you never know what might kind of spark uh, some some thinking so really really lots of really good food for thought thank you Hisa, so much for for this talk but also for this this uh great exchange uh, with with our attendees and, and 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 people watching so thank you a million um for your generosity and your insight thank you everyone who came to to listen to us the lecture is recorded it will be available you can find it in many places but again be inspired uh he says thank you for for teaching us and leading, leading us through this incredible talk so thanks a million uh, thank you thank you so much to everyone and uh and yeah well, I'm, I'm here for for you whenever you want <laughs> amazing amazing be in touch everyone we'll see you all soon have a great rest of the day thank you Jesus. thank you guys thank you bye